Good morning. It's good to have you with us today. I do just want to uh, announce um, at 9.30, we are starting a new class, Worldview for the Family in B210, helping our families develop a spiritual worldview, a biblical worldview. And so that's right after this service, right across the way there in room 210. And uh, Susie Chandler is teaching that. So I want to encourage you with that as well. We're in Matthew chapter 9 this morning. And we're working our way through Matthew. And Matthew chapter 9. Today we're talking about who is this son of man. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city last week. Uh, Pastor Andy talked about how he had gone over into Gadara and there were two men. He cast demons out of them. And the response of the city was, get out. They saw the power of Jesus and rather than respond to that, they told him to leave. And so he gets in the boat. He comes back to his own city, Capernaum. And behold, some people brought him a paralytic lying in a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, and that's a frightening thought sometimes, Jesus knows what you're thinking. You might think everybody else is full. Jesus knows what you're thinking. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your heart? For which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Now, he rose and went home. And when the crowd saw it, they were afraid and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. Now, when I read that story, as we often see in Matthew, my initial thought was Matthew left out all the good parts. If you read Mark and Luke's account of this story, do you know what happens? These four friends hear about Jesus. And they have another friend who's been paralyzed. And they want to get their friend to Jesus. So they pick up his cot, we don't know how far, but probably several miles, they carry their friend to Jesus. That is no small task. And then they get there, and you know what? They can't get in the house. You know why? Because it's surrounded by a crowd of people. And these people are keeping them from getting this man who needs to get to Jesus, to Jesus. But they're not deterred. They climb the roof and get this man on the roof. And so carrying him to the house was not hard enough. Now they get him on the roof. The roofs, those houses were flat level. They would use those houses, kind of roofs as an extra room. And so they get him up there. And then they've got to get him to Jesus. You know what they start doing? They tear the roof apart. Imagine I'm sitting there preaching today and all of a sudden stuff starts falling down, right? And hopefully it's not on me, but we're, you know, Dan's in trouble. Dan and Susie there. And they tear the roof apart and they lower this man down to Jesus. Matthew says none of that. Matthew's just like, oh, Jesus is there one day, and there's this paralyzed guy there. We're like, Jesus, you left off all the fun part. But you know what? Matthew does that a lot. The story of the madman of Gadara that Andy talked about. Matthew's version is much different than Mark and Luke's. Mark and Luke tell us that the people had chained one of these men. They had put him in chains and fetters, and he broke them. And this man lived in the cave and no one would come near him. He would attack him. And he would cut himself with stones. In fact, the demons within him were named legion because there were so many. A Roman legion consisted with at least 4,000 to 6,000 foot soldiers plus cavalry. And these demons were called legion. There were thousands of demons inside this man. And you know all Matthew says is Jesus gets to the shore and these two men possessed of demon come. We're like, Matthew, where's the good stuff? But here's what we need to understand. Matthew is a minimalist. Part of that probably is due to his personality. 
Part of that's through his profession. He was a tax collector. Do you know why he dealt with numbers? How much did you make? Okay, you owe this much taxes. He didn't care about your story. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. Here's the bottom line. He's a bottom line kind of guy. Not only that, I think Matthew recognizes something that many of us miss in life. He has learned the value of elimination. Someone has said the key to concentration is elimination. Some of us want to throw as much as we can to everything we do. The Mona Lisa would not be a better picture if it had trees. See, oftentimes what we leave out is as important as what we say. A lot of people struggle with this. A lot of people struggle with this when they tell stories. My mom's a wonderful woman. If you want advice on how to raise your kids, on relationships, she is an awesome person to go to. If you want someone who's going to help teach the Bible, need a Bible study taught, go to my mom. She's phenomenal. If you want to know how to speak grammar, go to my mom. She got high school English for 30 years. If you want to get to the bottom line of a story, don't go to my mom. Uh, about 15 years ago, I called home and I was talking to my mom. And she said, um, they, you, you do know they had to come call the ambulance for your dad at church Wednesday night. I'm like, no, what happened? Is dad okay? She said, well, let me tell you. She said, I'm in the foyer talking to Kay. Kay's her friend. I'm like, what does it have to do with dad? Why was the ambulance called to take my dad to the emergency room? How is he? She said, well, I'm getting to that. Kay had had a horrible day. I mean, Kay had just had a horrible day at work, and it was just, oh, and she's talking about, and we're going through, and they come in like, I don't care about Kay. Why is the ambulance coming to take my dad to the emergency room? So after about 30 minutes of learning about Kay's day, I finally got the bottom line. So I immediately called my brother and said, Wes, before you talk to mom, here's the quick rundown. All right. <laughs> See, you know what I needed to know? The ambulance came. This is what happened. All right. And oftentimes we, we, we mess up in that because we try to tell too much. You know what? Pastors and teachers can fall into that trap. There's so much in this passage. Uh, there's so much in this story. And we want to cover it all so we don't cover any of it well. In fact, my wife, her, her biggest criticism of my preaching over the years is she said, you tried to cover too much. She, you had three good sermons in there. Too bad you didn't have one great one. Right? She doesn't put it quite that way, but that's the translation. Because there's so much there, we want to teach it all. And you know what I've learned? I have to go to God and say, God, what is the message you want me to teach from all of this? And often the difference between a great sermon or a great Sunday school lesson or a great Bible study is not what we say, but what we choose to leave out. Because we give people so much they can't focus on anything. By the way, Jesus didn't teach that way. Sometimes people in church struggle with this understanding. You preach through a, I've done this where we preach through a passage on prayer where Jesus is talking about the need to keep going to God and keep going to God. And after that, people come up, well, Pastor, you didn't talk about the, the, the sin can hinder our prayers. I'm like, I, I didn't. It's not in the passage. Well, you don't believe that. Well, I do, but it's not in the passage, right? And they want us to teach everything the Bible says. Please understand, we are called to teach the whole counsel of God. I am not called to teach the whole counsel of God in one sermon. Aren't you glad of that, right? We'll be taking a break around three and then coming back for the rest of the sermon at four. No. Matthew grasped this. He is making a point, and so he intentionally leaves out everything that might distract from that point, even things that are good and interesting. Mark and Luke focus on the individual trees. Matthew wants us to see the forest. And so for the last chapter and a half, since the end of Matthew 7, through this passage of Matthew 9, Matthew is making one point. And there's one point he's wanted us to get. And he showed it to us in several different ways. And now we come to the place where he brings it together. 
And so we want to see this today. But before we do, I need to just go back to one statement here. <clears throat> so Jesus has gone in the house, and they bring the paralyzed person. And he looks at the paralyzed man, and he says, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees there, they're thinking this is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. So Jesus knows what they're thinking. So he looks at them and he says, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise up and walk. He says, he doesn't disagree with me. He's like, you're right, only God can forgive sins. But let me show you something else only God can do. And he says, but that you might know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. This passage and everything that Matthew has been talking about comes back to this statement that the Son of Man has authority on earth. Father, I come before you today. I thank you for your word. I pray you would just be with us today as we look into it, that you would guide us, that I would say nothing that is not consistent with your word and with what you would have me to say. Give me wisdom, clarity, and power. Open our hearts and minds to you. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. So we have this phrase, the Son of Man. This is the second time we've seen it. The first was when Jesus called the disciples. One man came to him and said, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And he said, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now he says that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. Matthew uses this phrase of Jesus, the Son of Man, more than all the other gospel writers combined. He's writing to Jews. This statement means something to Jews that it doesn't mean to everyone else. In fact, it's the most common way Jesus refers to himself. He refers to himself as the Son of Man far more than anything else. Now the question becomes, what does Jesus mean when he says the Son of Man? And what would his audience assume he means when he says it? This has brought about a lot of questions today. I found one place that said this week, they said Jesus calls himself Son of Man, a safe title for him to use. The title was originally used by the prophet Ezekiel to describe himself. He wanted to show that he was an ordinary person. Likewise, Jesus called himself Son of Man to remind the disciples that he was a person just like them. Now, that's kind of a consensus a lot of people think. There's just one problem with it. That is totally, completely wrong. There are three things that, that they, get, they miss, or several things here that they miss. Number one, they said Jesus calls himself Son of Man. Jesus does not call himself Son of Man. In fact, almost every time you see it, notice what Jesus calls himself. He calls himself what? The Son of Man. He's not saying, I'm a Son of Man, I'm just one of you. No, he is the Son of Man. This is a specific title. And as you go through the Gospel of Matthew, over and over, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. This is specific not generic. Yes, Ezekiel calls himself a son of man. God calls Ezekiel a son of man. But he never calls him the son of man. There's another problem they get wrong. They said Jesus calls himself son of man, a safe title for him to use. You want to see how safe this title was? Um, when Jesus is arrested, and he's being tried before the Sanhedrin. And they're trying to find a reason to put him to death. And Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said unto him, I abjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you from now on, you will see who? The Son of Man. Seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Do you know what the high priest doesn't say? Well, that was a safe thing for you to say. You know what he says? Oh, we don't have it there. I'm sorry. He goes on. You know what the high priest says? We don't need any more witnesses. He is blasphemed. He has to be crucified. 
So in the eyes of the high priests and the religious leaders, when Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, they say, that's blasphemy. So what's the big deal? Now, I know it's early in the morning. You're going to have to think with me for a second. We're, we're going to have to go deep. We're going to have to go in some uncomfortable territory for a minute. Because we're going to have to go a place most Christians don't want to go. I, I was talking to someone this week, and I said, as we deal with the spiritual realm of things, there are two extremes I find. Most conservative Christians don't want to deal with them. They find them uncomfortable and challenging, so let's just not deal with them. On the other hand, you have people that want to go all over the place that the Bible never goes to. So we're going to try to avoid both. All right? If God's Word teaches it, we're going to go into it. If God's Word ignores it, we're just going to say we're not going to go there. But, but, but in Deuteronomy 32, God says something. Listen to what He says. He's talking here about what happened after the Tower of Babel. Deuteronomy 32 Verse 7, remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations, ask your father and he will show you, your elders and they will tell you, when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the numbers of the sons of God, but the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. He says, God allotted according to the sons of God. The sons of God in that passage, often in the Old Testament, refers to created spiritual beings. We often refer to them as angels, but angels is a specific type of spiritual being. Angel means messenger. But there were all of these Elohim, these mighty beings, and God assigned different nations to different supernatural beings. We still see this illustrated in Daniel 7 and Daniel 10. In Daniel 10, Daniel's been praying. He's seen this vision. And he's been praying for days, fasting and praying for God to reveal what this vision means. And finally, I think it's like 40 days, the angel Gabriel comes to him. And he says, Daniel, highly favored before God. The very first day that you sought to understand, I was sent with an answer to your prayer. But I couldn't get through because I was withstood by the prince of Persia. And I could not get through. And so I had to call for Michael the archangel for backup. And Michael the archangel came and was able to get me through. And I've just come to deliver this message. And as soon as I'm done, I'm going back to fight with the prince of Persia. Now, that word prince means ruler. He is not talking about an earthly prince. He is not talking about the earthly ruler of Persia. No earthly ruler has a power to stop an angel. He's talking about that spiritual demonic power that was given authority over the nation of Persia. Now, now this is something Christians, we have not understood. And it heavily influences our view of our country. There are things here I, I don't even think we can understand. The implications, I don't even know if we want to go into. But here's the reality. There are spiritual powers that have authority over nations. And guess what? You cannot vote a spiritual power out of office. A spiritual entity is not on the ballot. That is why our hope of America is not in the ballot box. It is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And... As long as Christians put more hope and effort in getting someone elected than in winning the spiritual battles, America's never going to change. So I, re I read recently someone made this statement. They said more Christians leave churches over political views today than do over biblical views. They get upset if someone doesn't hold the same political views they do. I very seldom see anyone leave because of the Bible. But you know what? What God is telling us here is there is a supernatural warfare going on. There is a battle going on. There is something significant happening. And then we come to Daniel chapter 7. 
In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has another vision. And we won't look at the whole vision, but he sees four beasts. Three of them have these huge empires that span most of the world. And then they lose their dominion. Then comes the fourth. And he has a dominion. This is that last beast, the Antichrist. But then something happens. He sees in heaven a bunch of thrones are set up. In the Ancient of Days, the Almighty God takes his place on the throne. And then I want us to see what happens. In verse 7, And as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. The stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then, because the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, the horns that, that Antichrist, that beast there. And as I looked, the beast was killed, its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. There is some debate whether he's seeing just a vision or these beasts are actually those spiritual beings that are over those nations. And then something happens. I saw in the night vision, behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. That word like is not in the original Hebrew. All right? It's there to help us understand. But what it literally says, I saw in the night vision, behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came a, a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. In his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. So what, what Daniel sees is there are these other beasts, but then it's going to come a son of man, a descendant of man. And this son of man is going to come before the Almighty God. And he is going to be given dominion. That word dominion means authority and power to rule. He's going to be given authority and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. See, these other four beasts had a limited dominion. His is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away in his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. See, here's the problem. When Jesus stood before the high priest, and they said, are you the Christ? And he said, that's what you've said. I say unto you, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. They know exactly what Jesus just said. He is the one who will be given an everlasting kingdom and dominion and rule. That's what Jesus is referring to when he says the Son of Man. And this is what Matthew has been building to. In Matthew 7, Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount. And Matthew closes and says, When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as a scribe. Jesus taught with authority. And then you know what Matthew's going to tell us? Jesus is going to leave the mountain and he's going to go and live with authority. Do you know why Jesus could teach with authority? Because he had authority. And he goes down... And we see the story as it translates here. Jesus goes and shows his authority over disease. He kills the leper and the paralyzed. And the interesting thing about this is, if you go back to the Old Testament, there are miracles. But there are no miracles like this. There are two people in the Old Testament that are healed of leprosy. Neither one of them were healed by an individual. One was Miriam after she had um, tried to undermine the authority of Moses, and God struck her with leprosy for a week. The other was Naaman the Syrian. He had leprosy, came to Elisha, and Elisha said, go to the Jordan River, wash seven times, you'll be clean. Other than that, they're not healings in the Old Testament. Yes, they're miracles. They're displays of God's power. In fact, in John 9, I believe it is, Jesus heals a man who was born blind. And he grasps the significance of this. This man born blind 
is healed by Jesus on the Sabbath. And then Jesus goes away and is heard, and this brings up a, a, a turmoil. Could you imagine the stir that would bring even our society today? Some guy born blind walks up, and Andy walks over and heals him. Bam. You get a lot of attention, right? This man's been blind his whole life. Well, the Pharisees had already decided that anyone who claimed that Jesus was the Messiah would be kicked out of the synagogue. Or if they claimed Jesus was from God. So, so they call this man and they say, you know, what happened? He told them. And then they call his parents and the parents are like, we aren't talking about you. Talk to him. It is our son, but we don't know what happened. He's old enough. He could testify. So he's at least 20 years old. So they call this man back and they said, look, give glory to God. Admit this man is a sinner. He is not of God. And listen to what this man says. Why th they said, we don't know where he comes from. And this man said, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. See, this man realizes Jesus has authority over sickness and disease. And then we... See that Jesus has authority over the weather. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Andy talked about the story. Jesus and the disciples are crossing the sea, and they hit this huge storm. It was this powerful storm. And, and the disciples have spent their whole life on this lake. And you know what? They're panicking. That tells you how bad a storm it must have been. And you know what? They, Jesus is asleep, and they wake him up and say, do you not care that we're perishing? And he stands up, and the Bible says he rebuked the winds and said, be still. And it was still. And Jesus revealed he had authority over the weather. And then we see the passage from last week. <clears throat> Jesus revealed he had authority over demons. In Mark 1, it says that the people were amazed, so they questioned among themselves, what is this, a new teaching? With authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. But you know what? Think about that story for a second. From the earthly standpoint, the view of earth, Jesus and the disciples get out of a boat, and two madmen come towards them. But from a heavenly perspective, it's different. Jesus gets out of boat, and four to 6,000 demons come towards him. From a spiritual perspective, there's four to 6,000 demons versus Jesus. And do you know what happens? The demons don't fight. They beg. They surrender before they even fight. What kind of authority and power did they recognize in Jesus when they outnumber him 4,000 to 1 and they surrender before the battle even starts? Jesus has authority and power over demons. And then we come to the passage today and we see that Jesus comes to them and he, he says to this man, paralyzed, your sins are forgiven. And the, and the Pharisees get upset and the scribes get upset. And he says, but you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus has authority and power to forgive sins. Think for a second what that communicated to the people in that room. In Jesus' day, if you needed to have a sin forgiven, what did you have to do? You had to sacrifice, but you couldn't sacrifice this anywhere. Where did you have to sacrifice? In the temple. You've got to make a travel, a journey to Jerusalem. And once you get there, you've got to go to the temple. And then you've got to find a priest, and you've got to take the animal, and the lamb, or the goat, or some other animal... And the blood has to be cut and shed in the temple. And here, this small, poor, seemingly insignificant man 
in a small, insignificant corner, in a small, insignificant nation, is in a small, insignificant house, standing before the presence of the most significant person in all the world. Without one sacrifice being shed, without a journey being given, Jesus looks at him and says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, I wonder what that man thought, what the people who brought that man thought when they heard that news. We want him to be healed. You see, Jesus knew that his greatest need was not the use of his legs. Those legs would fail him again. He needed something greater. He needed forgiveness of sin. And Jesus has authority to forgive sins. Next week, we're going to see that Jesus even has authority to conquer death. Read this week, <clears throat> Mark Galley tells a story in Jesus Mean and Wild. His church in California had sponsored a group of um, refugees from Laos. And <clears throat> some of them started coming to the church, and after the service, they wanted to join the church, and they had very little Bible knowledge. And so he, he said, you know what, I, I'd like to make sure you all kind of understand. Would it be all right if I met with you all and we had a Bible study, just, just you all and us? And they said that would be great. And he said, despite the Laotians' lack of Christian knowledge, or maybe because of it, the Bible studies were the most interesting I ever had. And he said they read the passage in which Jesus calms the storm. And he said, as I usually did with the more theologically sophisticated groups, I asked them about the storms in their life. And he said, they looked puzzled. And so he elaborated. He said, we all have storms, we all have problems, worries, troubles. And this story teaches us that Jesus can give us peace in the midst of those storms. So what are your storms? And he said, they still look puzzled. And there was silence. Finally, one of the men hesitantly asked, do you mean that Jesus actually calmed the wind and sea in the middle of the storm? And Mark said, I thought he was finding the story incredulous, and I didn't want to get dragged down and distracted with the problem of miracles. So I replied, yes, but we should not get hung up on the details of the miracle. We should remember that Jesus can calm the storms in our life. He said, there's another stretch of awkward silence. And then came another reply. Well, if Jesus calmed the wind and waves, he must be a powerful man. At this, they all nodded vigorously and chatted excitedly to one another in Leo. And then Mark closed with this. He said, except for me, the room was full of wonder. And I suddenly realized they grasped the story better than I did. I thought about that, and I thought how often in our attempt to personalize the story of Jesus, we often diminish his power. We talk about Jesus being able to calm the storms of our life, and we don't focus enough on the fact that he stood on a boat in the midst of a storm and said, be still, and it was still. We focus on the fact that God helped us, Jesus helped these people that were struggling internally and we dismiss the fact that it was jesus against four thousand demons and jesus won and you know what because of that our prayers are small you say can god still do that i remember when i was a kid i was probably about 10 or 11 we we're swimming at a friend's house one summer day and the sky turned pitch black i'm just all of a sudden turned pitch black it was like someone flipped the switch my mom's like it's getting bad. We better get home before you know, get out of the storm. So we went home. Little did we know we actually went to the storm. Because right after we got home, a tornado would come down our street. We lived on a cold to say. There were about 10 or 11 houses there. We were at the end of the street. The hail, the winds, you could hear it blowing. The only thing we needed to do was pray. At the end of the storm, there were 68 trees that were down in our neighborhood. By the way, I'm not talking about 68 scrub trees in Prescott. I'm talking about 68 three-story pine trees. Not one of them landed on a house or a car. We had two cars in our driveway. We had our 
our uh, <coughs> house is here a little bit, probably by the size of this stage, and then one car. And then back of that, about the size, half another stage, another car. There was a pine tree between our house and the first car. There was a pine tree between the two cars. And there was a pine tree behind the tree in the second car. The tornado took one of the pine trees and wrapped it around the power lines but did not break the tree. Of course, my dad got home from work. His first thing was, is my Japanese maple okay? Well, don't worry about us, Dad. <laughs> it's okay. But you know what? You say, what are the odds that 68 pine trees are going to fall in 11 yards and none of them land on our house? There is a God who still controls the wind and the rain. And so often we get caught on personalizing that we fail to recognize the power and greatness and authority of the God we serve. And there's one part of this chapter I've not discussed yet. Jesus also has authority over the lives of those who claim to follow him. When people came and said, we want to follow you, he told them what it would cost. And here's the problem. Think about this Jesus. Think about the Son of Man. Jesus is greater than sickness and disease. Jesus is greater than suffering. Jesus is greater than nature. Jesus is greater than demons. Jesus is greater than sin and guilt. Now, is this the kind of person you ask into your life to be your assistant? See, that's where a lot of people fail. They say, man, there's this great God. I'm going to call on him when I need help. I hope he will come and help me fulfill my dreams and my goals and my plans. This is not the kind of person you call to ask to be your assistant. This is the kind of person you fall on your knees before and you say, have mercy on me, a sinner. And you cry out, oh Lord and my God. That's who this is. And see, if we read through the Gospel of Matthew and we look at the storms he can, saw, he can calm and the demons he can cast out, And it does not lead us to fall on our knees before him. We miss the point of the passage. It doesn't matter how many roofs are destroyed by people wanting to get their friend to Jesus. It doesn't matter how many chains the demon breaks. What matters is that you and I recognize that this son of God and son of man is able to forgive our sins. And he is worthy of our worship and our praise. That's the fourth Matthew wants us to see. As Dan comes, I just want to ask us today, if you're here today and you've never bowed before him to have your sins forgiven, the Bible says that all of us are sinners, yet God loved us enough that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on Calvary's cross for your sin and mine. And there is forgiveness of sin found in no other. You see, none of us are good enough because we have all sinned. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, we're going to have a moment of invitation. And I want to just beg you to come back. Pastor Andy's back there. I'll be back there. We'd love to talk with you and pray with you. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian. We want our song of invitation today to be a song of worship. We want it to be a time where we remember who this God we worship really is. So I just want to ask you to stand today. If, if you would like to talk with us or pray with us, we'd be glad to do that. But if you're here today, we'd just like to ask you just to join us today in a song of worship to the Son of Man who has an everlasting dominion and kingdom and is worthy of our worship and our praise.